Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength. That I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. If you'll open your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. The Bible says, He has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the world, the eons, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say amen. Tonight I want to preach a sermon entitled The Supremacy of Christ. The Supremacy of Christ. The Supremacy of Christ. I want to talk about the supremacy of Christ. We live in a very great time of church history. And I believe every man that has existed after the resurrection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is living or has lived in the best time of human history. Somebody shout amen. Sometimes we tend to take so lightly, to esteem so lightly, the blessing of living in this time, the glory of living in this time, after the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And some of us it's light because we do not have the full understanding of what it means to live in the New Testament dispensation. And it's what I came to share with you today. So you have a very clear appreciation of living this life. Somebody said amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verses 1, the writer speaks of a man called Samuel, a son of Hannah, given to her by the Lord and ordained to be a judge and the voice of a prophetic instruction in the time of Israel. He's raised by his mother, he's weaned to the age of 12. He's taken to the presence of Eli the priest, that he might serve before him. And the Bible says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. He ministered unto the Lord before Eli. Praise God. That means he served God under Eli. And the word of the Lord, the Bible says, was precious in those days. And the Bible says there was no open vision. Now this only means that God did not impart his mind by way of vision or revelation openly. At least not publicly. It wasn't so. Now the very word they use for precious is scarce. And it's human nature that whatever is scarce is precious. That when God gives abundance of a thing, some people lose the vision of its preciousness. And that is why the Bible says that it's the intent of God to teach you to separate the precious 
from the vial. He says, when you do that, he shall make you his mouthpiece. Somebody said, Amen. It's wisdom in God to separate what is precious and what is vile. And because of the scarcity of the word in that time, the Bible says the word was precious. It was scarce. There was no revelation. And there was no open vision in that time. Have you ever imagined living in a time where it's almost as though by divine plan and purpose, God refuses to reveal himself to men. And he refuses to cast vision on you. That's the time Israel lived in. Because they had frustrated and rejected and fought all the oracles that God had set before them. And at one point, like the Bible says, that the Spirit of God cannot strive with man. It is not in the nature of a gentle spirit to strive with a man's will. The Spirit of God is gentle. He's gentle. And his work is inviting. And when a man cannot receive by love what's available, the Spirit of God will not force, he will not impose himself on a man whose heart is not open. That's just the way of the Spirit. Because it's the way of love. It is not forceful. Imagine you lived in a time where there was no revelation, where there was no open vision. God wasn't speaking to men. It doesn't mean that the daily service of the old and the temple did not exist. Miracles existed. The Bible tells us that Hannah went in the praise of God in the time when revelation was scarce and vision was not there. And she prayed for a child. And the Lord gave her a child. So it does not mean necessarily that the preciousness or the scarcity of the word and vision means that God's full operation on us is decimated or it's done out with. No. There's always pockets of him deliberately extending his power because by divine order there are things that must happen in definitive periods and timetables of human history regardless of whether God wants it or he doesn't it was preordained that way because that is just how the mind of the spirit works I'll give an example that in the time Jesus came and in the conditions Jesus was born, they were not favorable. You understand what I'm saying? But it was important for God to bring Christ at that particular time because Jesus was fulfilling a bigger purpose than the convenience. It was not the most expected time. That is according to men. But according to divine purpose, it was the most appropriate, even though it was not the fitting time. I don't think that I would have wanted Jesus to be born in a manger, me. But it was the mind of God that the Christ was born in a manger, even though we would have preferred him to be born in a five-star hotel. But God brings the son in the time when there is no inn. To deliver a child. But even when the inn is not available, even when the physical resources are not available for Mary and Joseph, it was appropriate time with God. And Christ had to come at that given time. Somebody shout amen. Now, because many people don't know what the absence of vision can do, what the absence of revelation can do. Even when vision and revelation are available, they still cannot tell how important it is. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verses 18, he says, where there is no vision, the Bible says, people what? People what? Perish. 
The Bible says where there is no vision, people perish. Because we're not given names and a full understanding of what it means to perish. It does not mean that in the time when vision was scarce and the word was precious, lives were never lost. Lives are lost at every absence of revelation and vision. These revelation and vision are tagged to life. That is why Paul says that I have not shunned to preach the whole counsel, the full counsel of God. And he says, and therefore I'm not accountable of any man's blood. Because if the counsel is not full, we lose blood. Hosea 4, 6, he says, my people perish for a lack of what? Knowledge. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say amen. And if I can go a bit deeper in this also, I see that even the realms through which we receive revelation and vision, they are also classified. They are also ranked. They are also placed differently. Even though they all work together to the total sum of the fulfillment of the bigger purpose and plan of God. But they all have their place. And some realms of vision and revelation are inferior to other realms of vision and revelation. And when a man does not know the essence, the purpose of revelation and vision, that man also cannot tell what is inferior and what is superior. But in the realm of the spirit, in the kingdom of glass, there is inferior realms and superior realms of vision, of revelation. And all of these serve different purposes in the order God has ordained them. I'll give you an example. There are things that are accessible to you simply because of who you are and what God has called you to do. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's like if you're a teacher, by the gift of the teaching, the office of the teacher, there is revelations that are available for you as a teacher by reason of being a teacher. When a teacher teaches, you don't get shocked. Because they are teachers. Likewise, when a prophet prophesies, you should not get shocked. Oh my God, no, they are prophets. Do you understand what I'm saying? But, much as it is important, there are more superior realms that even go beyond the office. And these are tagged to divine purpose. Somebody shout hallelujah. Not all teachers are teaching according to divine purpose. Not all prophets are prophesying according to divine purpose. But yet they have their full work and commitment before God and only God can judge that. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is why I gave you an example and said that Eli had lost his place with God. But he could speak into a barren womb and it conceives. Do you understand what I'm saying? As a priest, he had lost his place, his full place of God. But he could speak into a barren womb and it conceives. Because that was in the order of his office as a priest. Let me give you another example. In John chapter 11, verses 47, we are taken to the time when they seized the Christ. And the Bible says, And then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we do? For this man doeth many miracles. They're talking about Jesus. And the Bible says, And if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. You see what their fear was? And one of them named Caiaphas, listen, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, listen, ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it's expedient for us 
that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should perish not. And this speck he, listen, not of himself. But the Bible says, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation also only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. A prophetic unction sat on a priest because he was the priest that year. That kind of revelation sat on him because he was the priest that year. That kind of revelation was not available to him because he was a man whose heart was yielded to God to hear the way of the Spirit. This kind of the prophetic that was functioning on Caiaphas was functioning on his life as a priest. Now the Bible says that you have been made priests and kings to the Most High God. Do you know what that means? There is revelation accessible for you. There is vision available for you. Because you're a priest. That's what the Bible says in Revelation 5.10. He says he has made unto our God kings and what? And priests and we shall reign on earth. Why do we reign on earth? Because there is things that are given to us by reason of us standing in God. Caiaphas did not prophesy the death and resurrection of the Christ because he understood by the book and that he was aligned in divine purpose to know the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No, he prophesied it because he was the high priest of that time. And I bet you, the Bible says he did not prophesy it of himself. Literally meaning he did not even know or understand the full revelation of what was prophesied. But he did prophesy. Who is understanding what I'm saying? I've given an example of a man called Ahithophel. The Bible says Ahithophel, the Bible says he was a man of counsel. And he lived in the days of David. And the Bible says that the counsel of Ahithophel was as the counsel of God. That when Ahithophel spoke, God spoke. His counsel was taken as the counsel of God. Ahithophel was not a man with godly counsel because he sat in the office of a man's heart seeking after God. But Ahithophel was a man with divine counsel because he was gifted in the office of wisdom. There's a difference. The Bible says, and the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, the Bible says, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. He knew God and said, when you talk to Ahithophel, it was as if you had consulted God himself. But Ahithophel did not function in that glory because he was a man whose heart was tugged to God. Ahithophel functioned in that glory because of the office in which he sat. And it's evident. Why? Because if Ahithophel really was a man from whom they sought the counsel or the oracle of God, he would not have set himself against the man with the heart of God. He would not have set himself against the man with the man after God's heart. Because later on, the Bible says he takes on and then he goes on the side of Absalom, right? And then he lets David go. Now he fulfill. That is why I say, even though it's vision and revelation, that one is a bit inferior. And yet that's the thing many people search for and would die for and would fast for and would pray for. Let me teach you something. There's a difference between a revelation you have by reason of the gift you have in God and a revelation that you will have by reason of seeking the heart of God. Likewise, there's a difference between a vision that will come by reason of the office of the prophetic you sit in or the priest versus the vision that will come to you because you seek after the heart of God. Those two look like they're the same, but they are different. Ahithophel had revelation, he had wisdom on his life, he had counsel of God on his life. He was an oracle during that time, tagged to God's voice, but he was a man who was detached from the heart of God. Eli still knew how God speaks, even when he could not hear God anymore. He could tell Samuel that this is how God speaks. When he speaks, he even knew how you answer God. It's the same thing here. 
that Caiaphas was not a man who was seeking and fasting. And then God revealed to him that this is the Messiah. There are two men who know that this man must die for the sake of the nation. Simeon is a prophet waiting on the salvation of Israel. As God has told him that you shall not die until you see the salvation of Israel. Caiaphas is also a man who is a priest. He sees that this Christ is the salvation of Israel. But he quite doesn't have the full experience of revelation of God's purpose and mind concerning the affair. But he speaks it. And to the people we minister to, many don't tell the difference between a man who is speaking by the spirit of revelation as a gift or the man who is speaking after the heart of God or as a man revealing vision by the office he sits or a man speaking vision by the heart of God revealed. It takes too much maturity to tell that difference. When you do, you separate the inferior from the superior. Somebody shout amen. And that is why I tell people, you cannot build ministry on the office. Because ministration is waiting on God. Gifts are prompted by nature. Ministry is purposed by maturity, maturation. It's God's design to entrust you with more because you've been faithful with a little. And the Bible says that all this must be proved. Now, because of that, when you tell a Christian you need vision, Many Christians ask for vision to know what their next job is, to know how many children they'll have, to know which spouse they'll marry, to know where they're supposed to be at a certain point in life and period of their destiny. And even though those things are all important, but they are not superior. They are inferior. And because they are inferior, I'm not saying they are not of necessity. They are of necessity, but they are inferior to seek when a man is seeking for vision. Likewise, when you tell Christians of our day and tell them, seek for revelation. They seek for the revelation to be delivered from devils. They seek for revelation to restore their businesses. They seek for revelation to succeed in their exams. They seek for revelation to settle in their relationships, which is all okay, but it's still inferior. And because it's inferior, I'm not saying it's not necessary, but I'm only saying that there's a superior way and vision in this kingdom of God. When Moses went on the mountain to seek, he did not go to seek For anything earthly. This was a man who went on the mountain. And he was seeking for the ultimate vision and revelation. God. God. And this man stays on the mountain for many days. He comes back from the mountain. And his face is shining. And the Bible says that Israel could not behold him because of the glory that was shining on his life. Because Moses understood the superior vision, God. And the Bible says that as the glory was diminishing, he veiled himself. But as soon as he turned again to God, the glory was dealt away with. You see a man of God, every time he turns to God, he's illuminated. Every time he turns to men, the longer he turns to men, a certain glory diminishes. And when that glory diminishes, he has to veil. Because veil is an excuse. The inability to be able to explain and give excuse for the things you must give excuse for. Because you're not supposed to give excuses for them. 
if you indeed have a vision and revelation of God. That is what he's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says in verses 15, now I'm talking about the superior realm. He says, even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Every time the law is read, it's upon their heart. Why? Because it looks at the sufficiencies and insufficiencies of a man. Don't steal. That is not a law to God. God doesn't steal. The godly nature cannot commit sin. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Why? Because it addresses itself to the carnal nature. Every time Moses is read, the veil is supposed to be upon their heart. Why? Because in any way they will be found wanting and with excuse. The message version says it on verse 15 and says, Even today when the proclamation of that old bankrupt government are read out, they can't see through it. Only Christ can get rid of the veil so they can see for themselves that there is nothing there. And verse 16 says, listen, whenever though, listen, they turn face to God as Moses did, God removes the veil and there they are face to face. That means every time they turn to God, there is no veil. They are face to face with him. Every time he turns to them, Moses, the glory will shine for a while and start to diminish. And then he'll have to veil. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now let's go to the KJV. Verse 16 says, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, now he's defining the ultimate vision, the veil shall be taken away. And the Bible says, now he says, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, he says, there is liberty. He's defining the superior vision. And the Bible says, but we all, we all, we all, he says, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. The Bible says we are changed, we are metamorphosed, we are translated into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It means that when you understand how to grasp the God vision, Every time you turn to him, you become like him. Every time it turns to him, the Bible says it's changed from glory to glory. Give me Amplified of verses 18. He says, and all of us with unveiled faces, because we continue to behold in the word of God. He says, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are constantly being transfigured into his very own image in ever-increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, when you turn and turn, the Bible says that we might grow into him in all things, which is the head of all principality. How can you grow into him in all things and ask for a job? How can you grow into him in all things and be sick? How can you grow into him in all things and fail to change your generation? How can you carry the glory of God and fail in this physical realm? It's not possible. But when we break before him, we seek for the inferior. Yet when you have the superior, you don't need to seek the inferior. The inferior will follow after. He says, these signs shall follow them that believe. The Bible says they shall cast out devils. They shall lay hands on the sick. If they take anything poisonous, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. All of these things are signs following men who know what to seek in God. God, at sundry times and in diverse manners, the Bible says, speak and to us in times past by the fathers, the prophets. Now he says, but now, in these last days, he is not speaking, he has spoken, and to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, heir of all things, heir of all things, by whom he made the eons, the ages, the periods, the times, he has spoken by him. How can you not understand that? How can you seek for inferior things? 
He's not speaking. He has spoken by Jesus. Because every time you see Jesus, you see what God has said. I said every time you see Jesus, you see what God has said. You don't look for a job. You see what he has said. He said, I was once young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous for second. Neither their seed begging bread. You don't seek for healing. You see what he has said. For he that knew no sin became sin. That you being dead and two sins might live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. You see what he has said. Be so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know that death. The Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I It is written of which the scriptures cannot be broken. But now we see Jesus. Tell your neighbor, but now we see Jesus. Tell him, but now we see Jesus. That's what he says. He says he has spoken. He has spoken by him. And the Bible says he's the brightness of his glory. The express image of this person upholding all things by the word of his power all things he didn't say by the power of his word he said by the word of his power by the word of his power by the word of his power why are we struggling We don't see him. The visions are not open. They are veiled. That is why we preach grace. To take away the veil. So men would see him clearly. As he is. That is why we minister the way we minister. That men might see him. That is whom we present every day to you. That when I leave this altar, you don't remember Apostle Grace, the man of God. But that you remember Christ and him crucified. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, he says, I will draw men to myself. When a minister ministers to his end, he has not yet seen God as he should. Because when you see him, everything about you melts. You become nothing in the glory of everything. Because you meet the fullness of him that filleth all things. And see that in the flesh you are empty. And without him you can do nothing. He becomes the vine and you become the branches. You draw water and life from him because he's the root of Jesse. How can you exalt yourself beyond measure? Years ago, many years ago, 
when I was praying, I was one of those days in my university days. God graced me the opportunity to see him as he is. When you see him, you never pray a certain way again. Because you start to realize even the things you think you need, he has more than you'll ever ask. And yet those things are nothing. When Paul saw him, he says, and of the things that I counted gain, he says, I have counted all that but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom he says, I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but done that I may win Christ. Why? Because when you see him, every time you want to see him, every moment you want to see him, it's not just what you see. It's who you become when you see. Oh, satala payarabaka telepa. It's not what you see. It's who you become when you start to see him. When a man has been with God, you can tell. The superior vision. Christ. The supreme. So he says, people never understood this. They asked for jobs. They asked for cars. They asked for children. They asked for healing. They asked for, and all of that was okay. But they lost the vision. They lost the vision. They lost the ultimate vision. They lost the superior one. They lost the superior revelation. Oh! Listen. We live in a dispensation. Where Caiaphas can say, you're called this. And people faint. But who is Jesus, Caiaphas? Who is Jesus? Do you know we live by inferior confirmation? Not superior affirmation? Do you know we are a generation that gets so amazed that God's working and his heart does not amaze us? His person does not amaze us. And you want to know why he doesn't? Because we don't know his heart. Again, I'm not against Caiaphas. But if Caiaphas knew, that is what he was trying to tell a Samaritan woman. You have refused to give me water. If you knew who was asking for water, you'd realize it was not about the water. There was a bigger picture in him. And many people don't know that. And people think that because Caiaphas knows he's going to die, that means they think that he knows more than that. But sometimes Caiaphas doesn't know more than that. That is why my heart's prayer, and the reason why God is moving the way he's moving in our dispensation, God is trying to raise men, teachers, pastors, evangelists, prophets, apostles, who know him who will give you the inferior vision and revelation but all of us must be able to give you the superior Christ he has explained what happened he says and as we behold him as we see him, as we turn to him, he says we are changed, we are transfigured, we are metamorphosed, and we are constantly being changed into his own image in ever increasing splendor from one degree of glory to another. We are transformed into him every time we see him. Now, if we are changed into him, what do we become to the world? Answer me what you become to the world when you're changed into him. When men see you, what do they see? It's the perfection of love. Oh! The apostles understood this mystery. They understood this mystery. 
they knew that when you get the superior one, the inferior will bow. One time Peter is walking on the temple called Beautiful. In Acts chapter 3 verses 2, he says a certain man crippled from his birth was being carried along. Listen, who was laid each day at the gate of the temple, which is called what? Which is called what? Beautiful. That he might beg for charitable gifts from those who entered the temple. Listen, the Bible says, when Peter saw and John were about to go into the temple, he asked them to give him a gift. And the Bible says, and Peter directed his gaze, a lame man, intently at him, and so did John. And what did I tell him? Look at us. Look, look, listen. We have been in a realm where we've beheld him long enough that when we come to a crippled body, a cancer, a tumor, a dead body, he just needs to look at us. And when they look at us, they are transfigured too. That's the generation that will walk on a crippled man and tell him, look at me. That will walk on a blind man, a blind man, and tell him, look at me. That will walk to a deaf man and tell him, look at me. That will walk on a man who has cancer and tell him, look at me. That it will walk on a man who's failing and tell him, look to us. I got something when I beheld this man, when I encountered the superior man, the supremacy of the Christ. Silver and gold have we not, but that which we have, which we received, which we touched, which we tested, concerning the word of life, he says we give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk he stretched out his hands the Bible says and lifted the man up with a firm grip and raised him up he didn't say the man was raised this was in the jurisdiction of Peter he says he raised him up and immediately his feet and ankle and bones received strength because they saw the vision. When the people that were around them saw that by a man looking at these guys, a crippled bone was healed, all of them looked at Peter and John sternly. And that is why in verses 12, Peter answered unto them, People, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Listen to the next slide. Why look ye so earnestly on us? It means when a lemon walked and they had heard that he said, look at us, they knew if we continue looking at this man. Oh! Oh! They knew if we continue looking at this man, something will change. And Jesus said, I mean Peter said, Why you look you honestly to us as though our own power and our own holiness has made this man to walk? He said, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, he said, has glorified his son. He's not looking at us. It, no, it's not about us. Why are you looking at us to think it's us who are this and we are the one? No! He said no. What you're seeing is the glory of the Son that we received as we beheld in a mirror. That is the thing you should look at. Peter diverted attention from himself. And when he did, the scriptures tell him, he preached to them to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Why? Because the end of that conversation always leads us to point to Him and to point men to Him and men's heart melts toward Him because it's Him we preach, crucified. That's the gospel. 
Let me tell you. Many years I used to open the Bible and read it. And I never used to understand it. But I remember the day I saw him. The Bible opened to me. There's a difference. I no longer open the Bible. The Bible is an open book. It's an open book. Because every time I look at it, I see him. I see him. The word is an experience. It is not something I preach out of duty. It is something I minister out of a passion. Because I have a certain relationship. Even when I worship him and I just raise my hands and say, Jesus. You're my friend forever. I see him. 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 He's alive. He's alive. Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. I said he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. When I open my eyes and I say Rabba Tolopa, he's there. I feel him. He's there. He's there. I've had encounters after that. Quite many. But every time I see him, something on my ministry changes. Somebody take it. Something on my life changes. Every time I see him. This last week he gave me something. He gave me something. And I saw it. And I woke up and I, I thanked him. I prayed. I said, God, thank you. Because you've stayed the vision. Listen, you can lose everything, but not that one. Lose the inferior, but not that one. Because when you have him, you have all things. The Bible says he was appointed heir of all things. And the worlds were formed by him. Without him, nothing was made. Every eon you personally want to create is in him. In him you live, move, and have your own being. How can you not know him? How can you not seek him? How can you not see him? The anointing that comes by the gift is different from the anointing that comes by the heart. When you meet that one, oh, 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 every time a man sits under the anointing of God that touches his heart, every time a man sits under you, they are changed. They are changed. Some of you, the things you're asking for, you're asking for the inferior. Ask for the superior. Pray, 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 pray. <laughs> Come on, pray. Seek the vision, Christ, the superior one. Be thou my peace, O Lord of my heart, Lord, be your hands to me, Savior, thou art, thou my best Lord, thy best, O my love. Thy presence, my life. 
Some of the things we seek for are nothing. It's just one moment of seeing him and everything in your life changes. I mean everything. God, I thank you because of what you're doing now. I thank you because of the person you're ministering to now. <laughs> Some of you are having open visions of him now. Somebody's eyes are opening up to see Christ. One which is greater than the angels. Some of you are visiting realms in the spirit like you've never seen before. The third, the fourth, the fifth. The dimensions of the spirit are coming to you right now. Somebody is receiving a vision in God. 
like you have never seen before. Somebody is receiving an encounter right now. Right now. <laughs> right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. God is showing you things so great to say. The anointing of the Spirit is separating you as a minister, as a child of God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Someone on this ground is seeing something. Someone on this ground is seeing something. Somebody right now is seeing something beyond words can say. Hey! Sarararamatarabaya. Sererereba kotalapaya. Zerima lala braka talapaye. Remando lobo siraba katalapa. Zerir remando rico selepa. Rira kaya ramando le kesele. Zareli kaisala paya rapa. Ria reko satalapa. May you see him. May you see him. May you see him. May you see him. There's a place for hungry people. I always say there's a place for hungry men. Hey! Oh God! Oh God! Oh! Oh! More than some of you expected tonight, some of you are having encounters that are going to change the rest of your life on earth. I see, I feel it, I see what God is doing on some people. I literally see God embrace certain individuals here. Jesus himself is here. Some people on this ground see him as he is. Father, we thank you. Oh! That's all you need there. He's all you need there. And as you behold, your change. Somebody give him a mighty hand of praise. Hey! Oh my God. That's Holy Spirit. 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 Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit. God's Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord. Give the Lord a man of praise. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to receive him as your Lord and Savior. There is nothing in this world as beautiful as receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He changed our lives. He will change yours. And so wherever you are, in this anointing and at this special moment, repeat this word after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I have heard your word tonight. I receive you in my heart as my Lord and Savior. Tonight, I'm born again. My life is changed. Amen. The message you have just heard 
was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero, make manifest.